space, the final frontier. Well, at least after we figure out what's at the bottom of the ocean. The point is that since the Homo sapiens crawled out of the gene pool, we've been looking upwards, trying to figure out what's going on beyond our celestial sphere. In the late 90s, Japan decided to give the rest of the planet their own special view of this, with a trio of shows starting with arguably the most overshadowed of the lot, Outlaw Star. The other two we've talked about already, but I've been saving this one for a special occasion, and thanks to a certain Irishman, I felt like it was finally time to delve into the eldest brother from the glory days of the anime space western. And not just dive into it, but rip it apart like never before and expose exactly how deep this overshadowed classic goes, even despite its general lack of attention from the mainstream. So here we go. This is Outlaw Star. Let's get into it. If you were to take a look at our backlog and then check out Outlaw Star, it should be no surprise that this show was a fix for me. It was a harbinger of the end of an era, a 4x3 hodgepodge of spiky hair, kinetic animation, and fluorescent color. From its release in 2001 on a Cartoon Network block that needs no introduction, all the way to this moment, Outlaw Star is eye crack. I could never get enough of the 90s aesthetic and hell, we based the whole look of our channel around it. But there's so much more to it. Like myself, Outlaw Star's mangaka Takahiko Ito was a big Star Wars fan and when looking to create, he first looked back at the wars and what made them international hits. You see, sci-fi for sci-fi's sake isn't enough to bring in the masses and neither is high fantasy by itself. However, what Outlaw Star did was mix together the ideas of magic Magic and technology and of the future and the past, a concept that bridges the boundaries of stubborn fandoms and snobs. And that's really what the heavens is about, isn't it? Because typically you see magic in fantasy and technology and sci-fi and each keeps to their own sphere, but on rare occasions they come together to create something new and exceptional. And like I said, Ito was a big Star Wars fan, and the Force is just a magical ability within a high-tech futuristic universe. The Jedi, a clan of monks from ancient times. The same can be said of the Tau spells the K pirates use or Jean's caster shells. The space western opens the expanse of the void in brilliant color, a lawless universe where anything goes. I mean, sure, there's some space military or whatever, but what, they're in like one episode? You get it. You're out in space, there's no rules, it's kill or be killed. And those types of stakes make it exhilarating to watch someone like Gene Starwind who rides by the seat of his pants. Space brings us back to an old setting we know, but shows it in an entirely new light. As we look up, we're not looking just towards the future, but into the past as well. We see the inexplicable billions of points of light ranging in distance and size. They seem close enough to grasp, but are far enough away to take a million lifetimes to reach, but one day, we may just finally grasp them. From the beginning of time, space was not just something to study scientifically, but something used to divine, to plot, to create the magics of the old world. Space and fantasy are intertwined and have always been. To ignore that is to ignore the fundamental spirituality of the mass of water and other elements that make up your chubby weeb ass. Those stars we see at night are the children of our own parents from eons past, the dead stars that blew themselves across the universe to form into what we are today as you watch a silly YouTube video. They call to us because they are a part of us. And what's funny is, on the surface, and according to quite a few reviewers, and believe me, I did my research, Outlaw Star falls short of its peers as a space western. Space is what we would consider the future of Manifest Destiny. A late coin term regarding westward expansion of the United States territory being a faded eventuality. From the early 1600s until the 20th century, Americans expanded westwards towards the Golden Coast. It was a time of lawlessness and vigilante justice usually served out by the muzzle of a gun. When we begin colonizing space, it's likely to be a similar experience. Too much expansion too fast for society to keep up with. Thus, law and justice will be served at will, swiftly and eloquently by the noose or the barrel. There will be men and women who serve the state, who serve themselves, and those who serve whatever they choose, i.e. lawmen, pirates, and outlaws like Gene and the Motley crew of the XGP-15A Mark II. Now like most anime, Outlaw Star started off as another funky radical bomb track out of the notebook, 
but this time of Takehiko Ito, a mangaka whose most popular work until then was a pulp series called Future Retro Hero Story, a manga that despite scouring the internet I could find extremely little information on, but what's important is that it and Outlaw Star share the same universe, the latter being set in the far-flung future of the aptly named towards Star's era. Despite the manga's first volume selling out completely in Japan and being translated into many languages, it was never released in English and to date little of it has been fan subbed. However, for our purposes that doesn't matter too much as the anime is said to deviate from the manga which, in Outlaw Star's case, is generally considered for the better. What is notable is the work that went into the manga and the hands which helped bring it to life. Yutaka Minoa is a name you may not have heard before, but from this man's brain came designs for some of the most influential characters in anime history. He worked on many Yoshiaki Kawajiri films like Ninja Scroll and Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust, as well as one of my personal favorite anime, The Record of Lodos War. His influence in character design can be seen across pop culture as well as Outlaw Star, most significantly in the ears of Aisha Clan Clan, an obvious cat girl variation of Deedlit, as well as the instantly recognizable 90s anime aesthetic of Outlaw Star, from Jim to Suzuka and back to the evil Onten 7's old world appearance. Then we have Shoji Kawamori, a man who should need no introduction yet lurks in the background like a ghost while creating some of the most iconic images in pop culture today. Credited as a starship designer, this is the guy responsible from across, which is not just the father of transforming mech, but a huge media franchise in and of itself, sporting multiple manga, anime, and over 40 video games. You may know the series better as Robotech. Also, he created Optimus Prime, so there's that. Between these three men, there was little in the way of success, and as always, when a manga does well, an anime is soon to follow. Enter Sunrise Studios, the mecha of modern mech, sporting not only most of the Gundam series but also a certain bebop ditty, but what's lesser known is their affiliation with non-Japanese works like Batman the Animated Series, one of the most proclaimed and progressive animation projects in the West to date. This was the studio to pick up and adapt Outlaw Star into an animation. Directed by Mitsuro Hongo, probably best known as the director of the most popular Japanese kids show ever, Kran Shinchan, as well as many others to date including works like Ascendants of a Bookworm. However, the icing on the cake is Ko Otani, the prolific composer who brought us scores from games to anime to movies including Shadow of the Colossus, Godzilla Attack of the Monsters, The Darkstalkers or Night Warriors OVAs, Gundam Wing, and City Hunter. With all of these major players set in stone, it would seem like the world was headed towards an anime for the ages, something to overshadow all before it and inspire all after. But what we got was Outlaw Star. Now you tell me, does the law work for you? Have you even bothered to wonder? Let me ask you a philosophical question. There's a pig farm with 10,000 pigs, bought en masse for fractions of their worth. They will all be slaughtered, butchered, and sold off in pieces to supermarkets for 10 times their worth. The cast off will be thrown in the trash. But you're starving and that pig will feed your family for months. Is it wrong to steal the pig? Is the pig's life not worth more in your hands? Are you not saving it from its factory farm hell? Will the company miss one pig? Will the company be hurt by one pig lost? An outlaw looks at the philosophy of the law and chooses where and when to hold or break its boundaries. There's a human nobility to the idea, a right when right gray area of existence not condoned by society, a freedom to choose. A pirate would steal all the pigs for their profit. A lawman would protect the company hoarding the pigs and wasting precious food that could go to the hungry. In the middle is always the outlaw living in the gray area of the black shadow cast by pirates in the white light of the lawman. In the universe of Outlaw Star, there is the Earth Federation, a combination of the USSA, Einhorn, Pyotr, and the Tempa empires. This federation exists to uphold the law across the universe as empires expand thanks to a meteorite which fell to China containing a mysterious ore called Dragonite. This ore allowed human technology to tap into the ether which propelled our vessels beyond light speed and ushered in a new era of expansion as 
well as an intergalactic gold rush. Within the Federation, the various empires compete and vie for power while they're threatened by the pirates who troll space looking for wealth to take for themselves. Centuries into this new frontier, a young boy and his father are spaceborne when they're attacked by bounty hunters, resulting in the death of the father and the boy being abandoned in the vacuum of space. This Oda Konoko would grow up to be Gene Starwind, a name reminiscent of the original Star Wars protagonist Luke Starkiller. Gene and his 11-year-old sidekick Jim Hawkins live on a wasteoid backwater planet called Sentinel-3 where they do odd jobs as outlaws. Gene takes the position of point man while the young genius Jim holds down the fort. That is, until they unwittingly take a bodyguard position for Hot Ice Hilda, a notorious outlaw and sworn enemy of the McDougal brothers and the Chinese K pirates, the latter group taking her arm and eye in a previous altercation. While Hilda's presence is quite literally short-lived, it's that presence which sets Gene in motion towards his inevitable destiny, the galactic ley line. Ginga no Ryu Myaku, or literally, the dragon's vein. Now I've heard the ley line be called a MacGuffin, and while it does drive the plot, in order to be a MacGuffin, the ley line would need to be ultimately irrelevant, which it's absolutely not. However, for a quick debrief, the ley line is a center point of the universe said to hold untold treasure. Perfect bait for a government, pirates, or a small band of outlaws with some serious debt. Now before being marooned on Sentinel-3, Hilda heard of a collaborative effort between the K-Pirates and the Earth Federation to reach the Galactic Ley Line, resulting in the creation of the iconic starship XGP-15A Mark II and a bio-android named Melfina, which Hilda swiftly stole out from under their noses like a badass. After being chased out of ether space, Hilda lands on Sentinel-3 in poor disguise. She sticks out like a sore blonde thumb and intertwines her life with Jean and Jim, eventually being hunted down by the K-Pirates and revealing her true identity to her new bodyguards. Along with this revelation comes the biggest missed opportunity for an unboxing video ever, Melfina, who is released from her shipping case at last to greet the universe as a consistent enigma. It's during this initial skirmish with the K-Pirates that the deeper layers of Outlaw Star first reveal their hand, one finger being the K's use of Tao magic and the second is the revelation of Jean's caster gun. The caster gun. Widely touted as one of the coolest anime weapons ever, it is actually a relic from the fixed star timeline in which future retro hero took place. Back then, mana was far more abundant in space, but now the caster shells Jean uses are a scarce resource. But we're gonna get into this more when we talk about the band episode. However, since I did mention that band episode, let's take a quick sec to talk about Outlaw Star then versus now. Originally airing on Toonami, Bandai, who had distribution rights in the West, had to heavily censor this series, resulting in not only an entire plot essential episode being cut, but quite a few digital alterations to scenes involving risque imagery, attempting to hide the fact that Suzuka is an assassin, as well as degaying the Outlaw Star crew's main money lender, Fred Luo, who is in fact very gay. However, now that the show is streaming on multiple platforms, it is the best time to witness it in all of its uncut glory. Now with Melfina in tow, Jean, Jim, and Hilda make their way off planet to the neutral blue haven. During their jump into space aboard Hilda's ship Horus, definitely no nods to any ancient Egyptian gods of the sky there, Jean's severe astrophobia kicks in, a scar left from his first flight ending in disaster. Anyway, to keep it brief because this is not a video summarizing this show, the group end up racing to the hidden XGP-15A Mark II when they realize it's about to be seized by either the McDougal brothers or the K-Pirates. After playing chicken with a Katarl Katarl warship, Hilda finds her backup already strewn across space in an ambush awaiting them. A desperate fight ensues for the XGP, resulting in Hilda free-falling in a gravity well while grappling with a K-Pirate. Melfina assumes her role as XGP's navigator while Hilda gives Jean her final blessing. Outlaws never go down easy, no matter what happens to them. And then she blows herself and her pursuer sky high. Or actually higher, cause they're in space. Jean, Jim, and Melfina fly off in the newly dubbed Outlaw Star. And then the plot meanders. And this is where people start crying about how the show falls off the rails. However, I totally disagree. To me, Outlaw Star feels a bit like Samurai Champloo in space. We have this group of individuals who, through considerable luck, fall in together and go on crazy adventures that often only connect to the overarching plot in a minuscule way. Yet yeah, it's these smaller stories within the whole that bring our five main companions together and develop the bonds between them. 
Outlaw Star is another in a long line of anime coming from the late 90s and early 2000s that revolves around a ragtag group of misfits coming together in episodic adventures that all sporadically steer them towards a final climactic story in the end. Each episode isn't necessarily formed around progressing the plot, but progressing our relationship with the characters as their real-time opinions of each other change and grow. And because there's this emphasis on the characters, it allows the plot to take a backseat role in the storytelling, hence us not really learning what the galactic ley line is until what, four-fifths of the way through the show? While that is the final destination that Outlaw Star is working towards, because the show highlights character relationships above all else, the final episodes revealing the secrets of the Galactic Ley Line are less about the treasure and prize of finding it, and more about the connection between each member of the Outlaw Star being put to the test. Those connections culminate in Jean's conversation with Malfina inside the Galactic Ley Line while floating around in cyberspace as Data in a scene I thought would eventually lead to Jean putting his one in Mel Zero. Instead, Melfina explains that in her current state she can grant Jean anything he wants, and while Professor Gwen Khan desires knowledge and Lord Hazanko craves power, Jean only wants Melfina to come back with him. His request plays into two themes, the first being that friendship is more important than money or power cause anime, and the second, the true treasure is the journey itself and the people you meet along the way. I can see why people might feel like the show loses some steam early on, and here's the rub. Not all stories are necessarily about the destination, but instead the journey towards that destination. No one is simply given a life-altering goal and then immediately proceeds to achieve it. These things take time. Things happen. Things change. The person I was 10 years ago couldn't do what I'm doing now. It took those 10 years to get here. And this knowledge guides us to the Tao. Outlaw Star is a Japanese anime entirely based around Chinese philosophy. However, to understand that, you have to take a step off the plank, a, a leap of faith, if you will. As philosophies go, Taoism is by far the most difficult to discuss. Not that I don't agree with it, but as someone who rigorously studied Zen Buddhism for years, I still find the Tao esoteric and incredibly cryptic. But there's a reason for that, and it is simple. Ancient Chinese secret is ancient Chinese secret. The Chinese are a very rigid and proud people. It is a civilization that is thousands of years old, and while I look at Mexicans and Canadians as my North American brothers and sisters, the Chinese do not generally view their neighbors as such. I know sex in America have been talking about building a wall for years now, but the Chinese have had one for centuries. The Koreans, the Japanese, the Mongolians, they are foreigners, period. As far as Taoism goes, it is a native religion to China, and like many Chinese things, it eventually made its way up into Japan, but Taoism was fragmented. Its influence can be seen in Shinto, but according to author Livia Khan, the most well-known practitioners of Japanese Taoism, the Koshin, are considered a cult. To this day, the greater depths of Taoism are largely guarded by the Chinese, but I'll do my best, and believe me, you're gonna love this. The Chinese symbol for Tao right here, translated into English means something that carries the head to sail forward. Great, thanks China. Basically what this means is that the Tao is the leader of the leader. Often Tao is said to be the way, but in practice, Tao is what creates the way, which you then take with your Tao. So the Tao is something larger than yourself, not a god per se, but you know, the Tao. The way is the way and you are the head which sails forward. Tao is also many things. Tao can be nature, time, but also something more obscure. There are many Tao, and to start sailing, you must first find your Tao. But then there's the larger Tao, the one that governs or is deep nature, but all Tao is inevitably connected in an ever-branching tree of sorts. Then there's the Te, the giving back to the Tao. This is a traditional rebirth kind of system. Think of it this way. Literally, my Tao, is YouTube. I devoted myself to the Tao, which then opens a path. That path is wherever YouTube takes me. I then go down that path with my Tao. To travel down this path, I must first put my full heart into this Tao, and as I follow the Tao, I give back to it by creating things which may inspire others to take up the Tao as their own. Giving back in this way is the day. Meanwhile, the greater Tao, the seasons, forces of nature, time, also open a path which I take, which ever so slightly opens paths for my Tao to deviate. So very, very simply, Tao is the leading essence which carries the universe to a certain path or direction. And here's another fun one just to fuck you up. You pour two cups of coffee, same beans, same water, same cups. 
but both coffees are entirely different entities, despite sharing the same name and origin and even container. They are completely different objects because their DAO is not the same DAO. DAO is more than what we see or the name we call it. It's more than the category something fits into. It's individualistic on a higher plane or realization. Now there's a point to this. In Outlaw Star, we see this Taoist magic being utilized by the Chinese K pirates, and Taoist magic is technically real or at least practiced. The idea revolves around emptiness, but a different kind of emptiness than what I learned from Zen. Instead of emptying oneself to flow naturally and connect with the present moment, Taoist magic can be about emptying an object to fill it with your Tao, thus transforming it into a container, a vessel for your Tao, your intention, your energy. So let's bring it back. Take best girl waifu S tier and assassin super A class Suzuka. Ever thought the fact that her sword is made of wood was a little strange? I mean, she cuts a bus in half with a wooden sword. That should leave you with some questions if you take your head out of your this is anime But However, as a dedicated assassin, Suzuka is able to turn that wooden sword into a deadly weapon beyond its natural capabilities. How? By turning her sword into a container. Her Tao is assassination by taking a practice katana and emptying it, essentially leaving behind its conceived essence, the idea that it is just a wooden sword, she's able to then fill it with her Tao, her goal, her path, her intent, which is assassination, and then project that through the sword. This results in her being able to cut and kill with it. It turns a wooden stick into a blade which cuts past its form. This is the essence of real world Taoist magic, filling a vessel with one's Tao to store it for various purposes, changing the vessel into pure essence in a shape. In Outlaw Star, this essence can be released at will by those proficient enough, resulting in what we witness as the once enigmatic Tao magic. You're welcome. Even Jean's caster gun, more importantly, its shells, begin to reflect this permeating concept of a vessel infused with Tao, but like the show, we seem to have meandered. Outlaw Star is above all else an experience, and like experience, it ebbs and flows in many ways. For instance, in contrast to its gorgeous and well-realized backdrops, its character animation sometimes goes from fluid, exaggerated, and fantastically smooth to utter garbage. There are scenes where Jean goes from looking like he has a lazy eye, uh, past hyperterrorism, and all the way straight up to craniofrontal nasal syndrome. However, this is no more than an occasional humorous hiccup you would expect from an anime of its era with a limited budget. The money went where it needed to and made it count. The space battles with this universe's ridiculous grappler ships are so fun to witness, and as the crew of the Outlaw Star fills out, we get our time to spend with them. The crew itself is this perfect hodgepodge of cliche brought together to become possibly the most iconographic group of 90s anime characters. You have the overconfident, horny, gunslinging rebel man, the innocent boy genius, the identity crisis android, the stoic ronin samurai, the logical mech, and over the top cat girl elfu shapeshifter. These five life forms and their ship are brought together across the galaxy through chance and circumstance, united by one thing reaching the galactic ley line, a goal that requires the mundane challenge of making enough money to fund it. And this is where we spend arguably the majority of the journey. It's through the misadventures of the Outlaw Star's crew trying to scrape together enough cash to fix their ship every time they get railroaded or pay off their galactic parking tickets that we get to learn and understand our heroes. Meanwhile, they and their adversaries inch closer and closer towards destiny. But when we look at the growth and the differences in these characters between episode one and the finale, Outlaw Star's message becomes clear. When we first meet Jean, he's basically just a bounty hunter who can't go into space without trauma-induced panic attacks. He's getting loaned money on the idea that it'll all be paid back once he makes it big. Yet in that moment where his bigness could have been made, he chooses a more wholesome path. And I think this choice speaks to a lot of people on a personal level. Melfina doesn't know who she is or her purpose for existing, and those questions drive the entire story. In a very real way, Outlaw Star is a story of self-identity, and that's something we all understand understand or at least want to understand. Life is about finding out who we are and what makes us unique, what makes us an individual, so when Melfina finally finds out that she was essentially created to be a tool and nothing else, Jean declining to use her for that intended purpose speaks volumes about who she is in his eyes. And that's something we typically cast aside when talking about self-identity, who we are 
to other people. Yet, I think self-identity comes from our relationship to others just as much as our inward definition. This moment in Outlaw Star is the apex of the idea that we can be anything we want to be. We aren't stuck on whatever path that was set out for us by our quote-unquote creators. While Melfina has very literal creators, the term could apply to parents, teachers, society, or anyone who has pushed you into a role that you don't necessarily want or even have an interest in. Personally, and I'm sure you can relate, I've had a lot of pressure in my life. It feels like there's always someone who expects me to be something I'm not or assumes that my role as an individual has only one narrow definition, like I was supposed to be a soccer player, I was supposed to be a straight-A student, supposed to be a teacher, a doctor, something that befit my quote-unquote intelligence. It felt like every definition of myself was merely a rest stop on the trail to some eventual future version of me where I had a wife and a house and kids and blah blah blah. But that future version of myself was never something I truly wanted. Yet to deviate from that path caused dissonance because I felt like I was letting down those around me when I didn't end up where I was supposed to be. For me, making YouTube videos, interacting with our patrons, doing this as a job and my passion flies right in the face of what my life was supposed to be. And I believe that's how Melfina feels about Jean taking her over riches and fame. It's a lesson that each and every one of us has a choice. We can deviate from the set path and make our own. And we should. And that's what's so important about Jean's next line. He asks Melfina what she wishes for. Cementing the idea that an individual's path is their choice and theirs alone. I believe that's the takeaway that Outlaw Star was made for. And all of this comes back to what we discussed earlier about Taoism. The Tao is what creates the way. In other words, you can choose what your Tao is. You can choose your path. And the finale of Outlaw Star shows both Malfina and Jean choosing their way yet again at what would be considered destiny's end. But this applies to more than just Jean and Malfina. Whether we're talking about self-obsessed or overconfident Aisha or the serene but deadly Suzuka, there's no doubt that the way these characters see themselves and their path in life drastically change. Suzuka began the story as an assassin, a sword for hire to the highest bidder who would never let her target get away, and allowed her victims to perform a sword of last rites as the sun went down, giving her the nickname Twilight. Her past is filled with two things, training and death. Four years before the events of Outlaw Star, Suzuka lived and trained in a remote village on an unknown planet. She lived and trained with her teacher and her life was simple. However, Hitoruga showed up requesting to be taught by the same teacher and after learning the techniques he wanted, Hitoruga killed their teacher and used Tao magic to blast Suzuka off a cliff, leaving her for dead. Suzuka's past truly fueled her future. She was determined to become stronger so she could face Hitoruga and avenge the family she had lost. With her backstory in the light, it makes perfect sense she would eventually become an assassin to own her skills while waiting for the opportunity to get revenge. Every kill is just another step on her path to avenging her dead teacher, yet upon her encounter with Jean, it seems that everything changes. Jean metaphorically kills Twilight Suzuka, and in doing so, frees her to do what she pleases. So while she vows to kill Jean before going after Fred again, she actively fights for Jean and the rest of the members of the Outlaw Star. It's even hinted that she may have deep feelings for Jean, and this is is exactly what I mean by choosing one's own path. Suzuka had a goal all along to find and kill the K pirate Hitoriga, but after her battle with Jean, the path toward that goal seems to have completely changed. It was no longer killing for the sake of getting stronger, it was fighting for the survival of newfound friends. However, in doing so, she still achieves her goal. So ultimately, her path, which she walked with her Tao, remained the same, but became beneficial once she began her day. She's yet another story of discovering that there's more than one way to forge your path through life and what you've done for years isn't necessarily what's best for you or the best way to do it. Aisha Clan Clan is similar in that respect, but her path is more about realizing that your home isn't the only place for you. There are plenty of people who grow up and never want to leave where they're from and never do, but there's something to be said about exploring, finding new places, finding yourself through that exploration. Aisha is the embodiment of that idea, starting out as a hot-headed, egocentric character from a noble family with a high-ranking position in the military who constantly raves about the glory and skills of the Kataral Kataral, only to eventually be humbled and learn what it's like to do honest work and eventually decide not to return to her home at all, preferring to stay an outlaw, and continuing to rave about the Kataral Kataral. While her main role is to provide comic relief, it's obvious that the journey has had a massive effect on her wants and needs. Opting not to go back to the Empire is all we need to know about what changed for Aisha. Freedom isn't something you're given, it's a state of the soul, and when the soul is set free, it finds the place where it belongs. 
If you connect the dots given to you in pieces by this story, it becomes clear that everyone throughout Outlaw Star is connected. Gene's meeting with Hot Ice Hilda was brought about by the McDougal brothers shooting down his father's ship, causing Gene to be earthbound by the resulting astrophobia from the incident. Gene's inevitable reunion with the McDougals happened through Hilda, and his first interaction with his eventual friend and crewmate Aisha Clan Clan was mere happenstance on the way to the XGP. His clash with the K Pirates eventually led to a mutual alignment with Twilight Suzuka, who was hired to kill Gene's main benefactor Fred Luo. All of these threads of fate lead towards one last pit stop on the way to the ley line, the hot spring planet. This episode is super plot integral but was in fact the episode that was cut from Toonami due to it being deemed not worth censoring, probably because it would have cost too much. Gene is gearing up for a final confrontation at the ley line and is looking for more caster shells for his gun. Again, rare ammunition which is no longer in production. Apparently on this planet there are wizards still capable of creating the shells and that's who Gene is here to find. Upon meeting said wizards he not only learns that they are hundreds of years old but also that planets have a certain amount of magic or mana within them. Back in the day wizards were called casters themselves and when mana began to dry up they found a way to seal it within capsules to be used with spell guns. The guns that were used in Outlaw Star's loose prequel Future Retro Hero Tales, a manga for which no plot summary exists and it's only been translated up to chapter 13 so frustratingly I cannot give you a ton of info on it. However, these wizards were apparently a part of the story and from what I have read, mana was a big deal back then. This is the major tie to the past and is also why the O of the show's logo reads future hero next generation. Now with this explanation of the caster shells we see yet again the influence of Dao magic within Outlaw Star, filling a casing with intent and then unleashing that intent. The wizard even remarks how he thought it was similar to Dao magic and when used against Dao magic it's cancelled out, arguably proving that both magics are just different forms of the same thing. However, this is just the beginning. If you haven't noticed by now there is a ton of Chinese cultural imagery throughout the universe universe of Outlaw Star, likely due to the influence of the Tempa Empire. Beyond that though is an invisible hand which opens the way for the story to take place, reaching through space and time towards the crew of the Outlaw Star, something foreshadowed as early as the OP. Dragons are an important cultural icon for most ancient civilizations, especially in the East, but I don't think many can measure up to the reverence given to the dragons of ancient China. For 7,000 years, the dragon has been the symbol of China and thus respected as such, and even more. Their design has also been influenced by Chinese philosophy down to its very scales which number 117, 36 being of yin essence and 81 being of yang essence. In Taoism, which is generally represented by the yin yang, the dragon is often considered the keeper of the Tao. And what better creature to be Tao than the ones that were said to govern the greater laws of nature in both a beneficial and destructive way. Dragons brought the rain but also the floods, and in that way they are neutral, representing both peace and destruction which are the opposing sides of existence as a whole. In the OP of Outlaw Star, there is an image of a dragon in an S shape with two pearls reminiscent of the yin yang and is obviously allegorical. This same symbol appears later in the series during episode 21 titled Grave of the Dragon in the ruins of an ancient civilization said to be at least 10,000 years old. In this episode, while discussing the ley line with Aisha, Jim mentions that the ley line was originally a term used by pirates that comes from Fuang Shi, meaning a path that she collects. Their energy lines they spoke of it as the dragon's cosmic breath. This makes it sound like the Fuang Shi is a language, but Fuang Shi is an ancient Chinese term for something along the lines of medicine scholar, but is directly associated with the Taoists as they were the medicinal scholars. And in some cases, such as this exact scenario, the Fuang Shi would mean magicians. Not only that, but the direct Japanese for the galactic ley line, Ginga no Ryu Myaku, literally translates to galactic dragon vein. Outlaw Star, this story, this journey is a path into the essence of the Tao, literally the vein of the dragon who is the keeper of the Tao. But why is it being taken by an idiot 
like Gene Starwind. One thing I haven't mentioned much yet is the humor in this show, which there is a lot, and much of it is very over-the-top physical comedy you'd expect from anime and Yan Yan's from the cat girl, but I'd be remiss not to highlight the levity. Gene is a perv and an impulsive, overconfident guy who gets himself into constant trouble, and if it wasn't for Jim keeping at least one of his toes on the ground, Gene likely would have died a long time ago. However, the guy has another side to him as well, and out of the group, he's easily the most realized individual. Much of his self-confidence is a front to shield his sensitive side, the side with fear and doubt, the side that would force himself on a girl he promised to help and then lash out at her when he's rejected. It's a side without the confidence in his ability to keep his promises or achieve his dreams. However, when you put the two together, what you get is someone in a tough spot who is inarguably human, which means being mixed up. Despite the literal black and white image of the yin yang, its purpose is to represent the idea that there is no true light or darkness. It symbolizes the mixing of the two, which creates the many shades of gray our lives are enveloped in. I don't think it's a coincidence that Jean, an outlaw, someone stuck in the middle of the lawful space force and the evil pirates, is our hero in a story heavily influenced by Taoism. Honestly, I think at this point we can all agree that influenced by Taoism is a little bit of an understatement. But Jean has a Tao, that of the outlaw, which has brought him down a path of that Tao. In this universe, the outlaw is the only person who is free to affiliate as they see fit, a point driven home by Hilda herself. It's a mantra taken up by Jean and a motivating force for him during the darkest of times. If there's the slimmest chance, no matter how small, you have to go for it. Never give up hope. And that's what it means to be an outlaw. But that's also what it means to commit yourself to the Tao. It's this dedication to the Tao which leads Gene to the dragon's vein in which he's able to find the answer to what he truly wishes for. Outlaw Star is more than just a meandering anime filled with guns and magic. It's a show with symbolism regarding the paths we all take in life, Taoist teachings, and lastly, the necessary harmony between the mind, the body, and the soul. Our main trio, Jim, Jean, and Melfina, each represent one of these characteristics. Jim being the mind, Jean is the body, and Melfina is the soul. At the outset, Jim and Jean are just a duo of fix-it types who will take any odd job if the money is right. And when they take on Hilda's job, the two get swept up in this battle between famous outlaw pirates and the government. Multiple episodes set up the plot and its factions for the entire series, but in episode 4, when Hilda heroically dies, things change and this connection of mind, body, and soul begins to truly reveal itself. Without Hilda to run the show, the responsibility to Melfina transfers to Jim and Jean. The show is no longer about taking her somewhere, but taking care of her as a person. She is essentially lost, confused by who she is, what she is, with no memories to count on. Melfina can only rely on the people around her, so she won't be taken advantage of or used as a tool. Jim, being the brains of the crew, is tech-savvy constantly at his computer, making plans and following through on them, making repairs. And Jean is the body, he's the fighter, the man-at-arms, the protector. And Melfina the soul, the most delicate of the three, constantly attempting to understand herself and her role amongst the others, but also capable of amazing feats that the other two could never accomplish, like navigating to the galactic ley line. It's the responsibility of the body and mind to protect the soul while it searches for freedom, for its Tao. If done correctly, the trio will feel complete. And this symbolism continues throughout the show, with Jean and Jim constantly working to protect and help Melfina towards her path. And in doing so, they're helping themselves in the process. Tay. It's also important to note that at the end of the anime, this trio stays together while Aisha and Suzuka briefly depart. It's clear that these three need each other to feel whole. When harmoniously working together, they seem unstoppable. However, it takes the entire show for them to get to that point of synchronicity. And it's only when their goals truly align, when the Tao is realized, that we see all three facets coming together harmoniously. And when they do, they're able to beat Lord Hazanko, despite his new intensely powerful supernova I don't know, met God form. Behind a goofy exterior filled with episodic short stories is a beautiful and immersive journey about understanding oneself and finding the path laid before you. It bridges the gaps between the different facets of who you are. It's a story that allows you to take it as seriously as you want, whether you're just in it for the laughs or whether you're looking for something to open your eyes and remind yourself why you're here. In the year Outlaw Star released, it was quickly 
literally within months, joined by Trigun and Cowboy Bebop and was instantly overshadowed, which in my eyes is due to the show asking a lot from its audience. However, that too is on theme. To look, to search, to go beyond to find what's lying beneath the surface of something that may outwardly appear relatively normal. At the apex of the story, in the heart of the ley line, the dragon's vein, where all key converges, a place where the lines of that key can be reset, is it not fitting that little has changed in the aftermath? Melfina, a tool fabricated by men to reach the ley line, is physically the same being but has let go of her concern regarding that. She's found freedom and the balance of the universe remained intact, arguably untouched. I find the fact that nothing of great significance happened to be the most significant thing of all. Because what is significance without the human element placed upon it? The Tao is yours, so while Outlaw Star may have gotten the short end of the stick when it comes to space western anime, while it may not be algorithmically optimal to produce a 40 minute video on the series. I believe that we shouldn't let what we love be overshadowed or forgotten. So, I'll see you later Space Cowboy. This video would not have been possible without our patrons. So thank you so much for making it to the end. And we have just a couple shout outs to make. Our lucky patron of the week is Matches Malone. Matches Malone, thank you so much for being our patron. And our Super Saiyan God of the week is your boy, Luthi. Luthi, thank you so much for your very generous donation to the channel. Anyway, you've been here long enough, so I'm gonna keep this nice, short, and sweet. Make sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram. That is bonsai underscore pop on both of those. Check us out on TWITCH.com slash bonsai pop. We got lots of stuff coming for you in the future. It's gonna be awesome, so make sure you subscribe and stick around. My name is Mike. This is Bonsai Pop. Thank you so much for watching. I'm gonna go sleep for a couple days. Bye.